Do you want to get the door there? So I'm delighted to introduce uh, Mark Leno. Mark and I started working together on the JavaScript standardization committee. What was it? Maybe 10, 13 years ago? Uh, I started in 2007, so that puts a floor on it. OK, so uh, around, we're around that time. Um, so Mark has done uh, fantastic work, I guess mostly focused around language-based security and object capability systems. He was the lead designer of uh, two programming languages. One was E, uh, way back when. Uh, and then more recently is a Dr. SES, Secure ECMAScript. Uh, he got his PhD from, I think it's John Hopkins. That's right. 2006. That's right. Okay. Um, he was uh, working at Google till recently. Uh, he recently left and is now part of a startup called Agoris that focuses on decentralized secure computing. Um, and this fundamental question of how we build secure computer systems is like a brutally hard, brutally important question. Uh, and so I'm delighted to have uh, Mark here to talk to us about the work that uh, he is doing on this area. Okay, so let's give him a big hand. Okay, so um, as uh, Cormac said, I'm going to be speaking about how we can make our computers more secure. Uh, I consider the current status of computer security to be a disaster and a disaster that's not addressable within the paradigms uh, that we're currently running on, within the infrastructure that our civilization now rests on. Uh, in order to uh, be able to use computers for issues that actually matter, uh, we need something better. And what is it that actually matters is cooperation, is both our ability to do computer-mediated cooperation with each other uh, as well as the ability of subsystems within um, the, the systems that we're creating, the subsystems to themselves be able to cooperate with each other uh, while protected from each other's misbehavior. Um, uh, cooperation comes at a price of safety. Um, and what we need to do is to lift the trade-off curve. Um, we need to uh, figure out how we can uh, change the infrastructure and change the patterns and ways of thinking with which you use the infrastructure so that we can achieve much more cooperation for the same level of risk uh, and much less risk for the same level of cooperation. If we can lower the cost of cooperation, we can arrive at a much more cooperative world. So, so Mark, are you, how do you feel about questions in the middle? Uh, so actually, uh, do I have the full 90 minute slot? Yeah, yeah. I feel fine about questions in the middle. Fascinating. Uh, you're talking about people cooperation. It strikes me one interesting issue is people cooperating, and over like the evolution of humanity, things like democracy have been fantastically useful as a way for people to cooperate. Markets are another fantastically useful mechanism for cooperation, and we wouldn't be here if we hadn't evolved those kinds of systems. So it's yeah. So um, uh, good. I'm, I'm uh, the I'm very much influenced by the history of uh, institutions and, and frameworks for interacting in human society and the way human society has become more cooperative over time. Uh, in S Steven Pinker's um, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, Enlightenment Now, document this incredible, incredible um, uh, decrease in the amount of violent interactions between people. And uh, in the absence of violent interaction, you have a system that's dominated by mutually voluntary interaction. And a system and, and mutually voluntary interaction is one that's generally engaged in when all sides anticipate benefit. And we've seen over the same period of time this massive and accelerating increase in wealth and well being and this extremely massive um, uh, 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 raising of people out of poverty. While the overall population has been zooming up, the uh, poverty, people living in, 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 in extreme poverty in absolute numbers, not just as a proportion, has been plummeting tremendously. So, uh, so I've been inspired by all that. I won't claim that, that 
uh, all of the richness of that is going to show up in the mechanisms I present in that talk. Um, but the thing to notice about uh, those institutions is that uh, the market uh, fabric uh, is largely a fabric of contracts. And the fabric of contracts are themselves, the, the meaning of a contract ultimately is the behavior it provokes in an enforcement mechanism. And for all legal contracts, what we mean by a legal contract is that the enforcement behavior that it invokes is one by a legal system. Our legal systems are expensive, they're, they're, they, um, uh, they're backed by lawyers, uh, they, the rules are not, not something that anybody other than lawyers can understand, and most of all, it's jurisdiction based. Uh, and uh, markets now, especially computer mediated markets, just don't even notice jurisdictional boundaries. They're worldwide. Uh, so jurisdictional based law based on expensive experts and rules nobody understands uh, is not a good institutional place to be to continue to foster cooperation along the globe. Um, uh, so this is getting much more philosophical actually than I planned to on, on the talk, but it's all worth saying, I think. Um, uh, so on the, on the fabric of cooperative market activity, there's smart contracts in a very literal sense, which is contracts uh, backed by a, a software and cryptography-based enforcement mechanism rather than a jurisdiction-based enforcement mechanism. Uh, but there's also smart contracts to experiment with new systems of governance. So a lot of this evolution of cooperation in human society is people experimenting, like with democracy, with new forms of governance. Uh, suddenly we have a toolkit um, with uh, blockchain-based smart contracting for people to try out new forms of governance, things like futarchy, uh, which is uh, governance based on a particular feedback loop through prediction markets. Um, uh, as we should expect, um, uh, as in, bio in biology, most mutations are fatal, fatal. As people proceed with these experiments, we should expect a lot of failed experiments because um, uh, people are complicated and governance systems uh, putting together people are complicated. Um, uh, but some of these experiments will succeed brilliantly and change the world. Uh, so that's really sort of my long-term sense of why we're doing this, um, is to uh, really continue to accelerate the, our greater ability to cooperate with each other uh, and to do so by lowering the risk of cooperation. So about that risk, in order to take steps uh, to lower risk, um, we need some framework in which we can uh, understand how different techniques for lowering risk, risk might uh, interact and compose together. So I'm going to uh, uh, present a visualization of our risk as an attack surface. And uh, I'm going to use it uh, to talk about expected risk. Expected risk is just the flip side of expected value. Uh, it's um, uh, the integral of the likelihood uh, of an exploitable vulnerability uh, um, times for each vulnerability the amount of damage that vulnerability might cause if exploited. Um, uh, so, the, so the area um, of, of this surface taken together is a good first measure of aggregate risk. I should, I should just say by, that there's many second order terms, there's many other things that are not captured in this, uh, but it's good to have a first approximation that gives us a first framework, a first approximation for thinking about risk. So the problem with likelihood and damage is uh, they're difficult to reason about. So Instead, we choose a, cruder, a yet cruder approximation um, of these proxy measures of representing the likelihood of exploitable vulnerabilities by simply enumerating the various fallible agents, uh, the agents that might be malicious or might just be um, vulnerable in a way that uh, an attacker can exploit. Uh, and then for each agent, we enumerate not the total damage they can do, but the resources 
that they have access to such that their misbehavior could cause damage to those resources. Yeah. Sorry, just one thing. Um, this isn't like this isn't in terms of actions. It seems there are more like buckets, like you know, so you have potential agents in here. I'm sorry. As in, it's not like there's more agents doing as you go down the chart. No, it is. It's it's each row is is intended to yeah. each row is intended to be a separate agent, right. and each column is intended to be a separate resource the agent might damage. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, this. Visualization, where the rows are the agents, the active entities, and the columns are the resources they might act on, uh, resembles the classic access matrix. But the classic access matrix is a matrix of permission, of the, of, of the, of the representation within the security system of the direct ability of one agent to act on a resource. Um, whereas what we need to reason about risk is an access matrix of authority where authority includes permission, but also includes uh, the indirect action, uh, where agents can cause effects uh, by acting through the voluntary behavior of other agents. Uh, voluntary doesn't mean um, that the other agent isn't misled. Um, the, um, so this composition of direct and indirect action forms authority, and that's what we're trying to, to visualize here. So when operating systems started, when operating systems started, they didn't have any protection. They were just a way to timeshare the underlying machine. Um, so uh, all the participants, all the, the users of the operating system had access to all of the resources. So everyone could mess with everything uh, the, the attack surface was complete. The operating systems early on, very early on, discovered the concept of separate accounts and then giving access to resources to different accounts where Alan can mess with Alan's stuff, Barb can mess with Barb's stuff, Doug can mess with Doug's stuff, and uh, Barb can give Alan permission to mess with some of her stuff. Now, there's a component on this diagram that we'll be returning to again and again um, as we proceed, which is the TCB. For an operating system, the TCB is um, uh, the operating system kernel. Uh, in general, I'm going to generalize the notion of TCB to the component at every level of composition, which is the mechanism that subdivides the authority uh, um, uh, uh, given to the things, to the subsystems within that component. So for every level of composition, there's some mechanism that does that. And since that's the thing handing out the separated authority, uh, if there's a bug in it, then all the resources entrusted to it are vulnerable. Yeah? So I assume you, you mean personal computer rules. Yes. Uh, the reason I, I, I just said TCB is because Every time I introduce the word trust into a conversation, people get confused. Uh, so I'll just uh, ma make a side comment. Uh, in computer security discussions, anytime somebody says trust, substitute is vulnerable to. Uh, when A trusts B, uh, maybe uh, really A is vulnerable to B. Maybe because B holds a gun to A's head, it's not very informative to, do, to, to talk about that gun-holding situation as A trusts B. Trust is not trustworthy. It's also not trust. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so, um, so in any case, this is a hollowing out of the attack surface. Um, having reduced the aggregate risk this much, uh, what can we do to reduce aggregate ri the, the, our overall risk further? Well, let's focus in on the Doug account, where Doug is messing with Doug's stuff. In a classic operating system where Doug is running installed applications, all of Doug's applications run as Doug, and therefore 
uh, every application can destroy, can do anything that Doug can do, meaning it can destroy all the resources uh, that Doug uh, is, that Doug himself has the ability to manipulate. Um, so at this level, under a classic operating system, uh, the attack surface was also complete. Um, in the modern world, people don't run applications so much as they run uh, mobile apps or interact with websites. When they run mobile apps or interact with websites, um, uh, the different apps are, are given different subsets of the user's authority. Um, uh, likewise, uh, when I visit Facebook, Facebook, uh, you know, all of my stuff at Facebook uh, is vulnerable to any bug on my Facebook page or any injection on my Facebook page, but my, um, my resources that I maintain at other websites are not. So there's this division, both among websites and among apps, that, that is a next level down of hollowing out the attack surface. So we have made progress. So having gotten this far, what more can we do to reduce our risk? Well, at this point, um, it's depressing to say that we now have to turn to research systems because the next steps are not one we can take in any uh, mainstream system. And I'm going to uh, couch the remainder of the talk uh, in terms of the research systems that I've been examining, uh, which are object capability systems. Uh, object capability systems object capability systems, first of all, address very naturally uh, this problem of too much authority. And it does it in a compositional form, which we'll come back to. Uh, but but let's, let me first of all just define what I mean by object capabilities. A good place to start the explanation is by imagining a programming language. So, you know, just take an example of a programming language. Java is a perfectly fine example, where the language itself is memory safe uh, and the objects are truly encapsulated uh, and the API surface of the objects is tamper-proof. So um, if Al, if, if so over here we have objects Alice, Bob, and Carol. We have Alice invoking the method foo of Bob, passing Alice's reference to Carol as an argument. Um, so in Java, these object references are already a form of permission. Uh, it's already the case that among Java objects, if Bob does not already have a reference to Carol, Bob simply cannot access Carol. Bob cannot do anything to provoke the activity that would be provoked by, Car by invoking Carol's um, methods. However, when Alice invokes Bob, she's doing two things coupled together. Uh, that, you know, the, the, something that in conventional security terminology would be considered two things. To an object programmer, it's just one action, the message send or the method invocation. Um, from a security perspective, Alice is both exercising her right to invoke Bob's behavior, and Alice is authorizing Bob to access Carol. And the authorization crucially comes only in the context of a request. So when Bob receives the permission to access Carol, Bob understands why he's given that permission and can use different permissions in ways that respect their different purposes. So, um, so that's, a lot of that's already true with languages like Java, but they're not object capability languages. The main differentiator um, uh, is that in an object capability language, only object references carry causality. An object cannot cause effects on the world outside of itself other than by invoking references that it holds. It's not given any powerful references by default, and therefore, uh, only explicitly provided references uh, as they propagate through the system are, uh, are, the, are the things that, that provide the ability for one object to cause effects elsewhere. So with this restriction, the reference graph of the programming language literature becomes the access graph of the access control literature. Yeah? Uh, 
So uh, in Java, by the rules of Java, the square root function in my math library has permission to delete all of my files without anybody having given it an object, uh, the square root function is already um, uh, able to simply import java.io.file, and by that magic import, uh, it is then able to, um, to do anything that I can do. So the, the logic of the Java import is the means by which Java programs exercise the user's authority, and thereby the means by which um, uh, they have uh, unrestricted access to that authority, can do any damage that, uh, that, the, that the user could have done to themselves. Um, there's a, a Java is actually a nice example because there's an object capability variant of Java called Joe E, um, then by uh, Adrian Mettler at Berkeley, uh, that, uh, which, which is uh, done only by static verification. Um, uh, imposed in front of Java. So any, any Java program that passes the Joey verifier is a Joey program. Uh, Joey programs cannot obtain permission by using import. <coughs> yeah? This is another way of saying this. Are you going to get into non-forgeability? Yeah. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just, I mean, I wasn't planning to get into it separately, but, but now is a perfectly good time to mention it. Object references are unforgeable. And the unforgeability does not depend on lack of knowledge. And this is actually one of the things that's actually very nice about the papers about Joey, is they said, let's assume there's no confidentiality. Let's assume that no object can hold any secrets from any other object, including the memory, you know, including, let's say, Bob knowing the memory location of Carol. It's still the case, just in Java, even without Joey, Bob not knowing the memory, know, Bob knowing the memory address of Carol does not give Bob any ability to act on Carol. The Java object references are unforgeable. In general, uh, object capabilities, uh, um, uh, by definition, uh, so not in general, by definition, object capabilities are unforgeable. Uh, the distributed form of object capabilities over networks, uh, because networks uh, between mutually suspicious machines over open networks can only rely on cryptography object capabilities cannot be better than unguessable, but they can be strongly unguessable, and that is, for most purposes, an adequate emulation of unforgeable. There are, there are some crucial differences that I won't get into today. So with object capabilities, we have a very important graph connectivity property. We call only connectivity begets connectivity. If you have two almost isolated subgraphs, sorry, if you have two isolated subgraphs, they must remain forever isolated because no object is ever in a position to introduce them. Uh, and that's the reason why, why normal garbage collection is transparent, is because if it's, not, if it's not otherwise reachable, it can be thrown away without any visible effect. The more interesting thing from a security perspective is that uh, two subgraphs which are almost unreachable from each other can only interact or become further connected according to the behavior of an object that, ha that of uh, the objects that have a foot in both subgraphs. And therefore, those are the crucial places in the, in the topology to place the objects that express security policy. Uh, and returning to the thing about <coughs> uh, um, uh, any of Bob's applications can delete any of his files. <coughs> Object capabilities give us a very natural expression of least authority, which is the starting point is that it, the interface to an object, the methods of an object, are the means by which other objects give it permission. And the object's interface generally doesn't ask for permission that is unrelated to the legitimate job it's supposed to do. Uh, and then, um, uh, so that's already a huge improvement over the status quo. And then starting from there, you can engage in security patterns to reduce authority yet further. So having presented uh, object capabilities in programming language terms, I wanted to emphasize that object capabilities are a general logic that is not in any way specific to programming languages. Just like Digital logic doesn't care whether the underlying substrate is transistors or relays. Uh, the 
the logic of object capabilities and object capability security patterns uh, doesn't care what the nature of the substrate are. And object capabilities have actually been implemented across this entire range of substrates. To proceed uh, with our example, I'll be using um, a case study we did uh, in my language E um, uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, E and CAPDESK, and the original form of the CAPTP cryptographic capability protocol, CAPTP for Capability Transport Protocol. Um, so, um, so at this point, I'm going to uh, be talking about that historical system, which is um, we built a capability-oriented user interface, a, a capability-oriented desktop uh, for the user to run. Uh, and the, the, under this desktop, the various caplets under the desktop would receive permissions um, uh, to various resources according to the user interface actions of the user. These weren't new user interface actions. This was simply new meaning attributed to existing familiar user interface actions. So a drag and drop or a file open dialog box would give the receiving agent the permission to operate on the thing that the user selected for them to receive. So those user interface actions, basically saying this thing should operate on that thing, is basically um, the user in the role of message passing, sending a message to, to one caplet uh, with arguments being other things that they're designating. And as with message passing at the object level, uh, CapDesk um, used those user interface actions uh, as the means by which uh, caplets were granted permission. But so the initial issue of what permissions were given to what caplets very much resembles what happened since then with regard to mobile apps and the web, et cetera. However, because of the deeply compositional nature of object capabilities, it doesn't stop at this scale. We, um, we can continue hollowing out the attack surface. So let's focus in on the capmail caplet. The capmail caplet um, is not given you uh, access to some spreadsheet um, uh, file, but it is given various other things, including very dangerously a PGP key ring. Um, so let's focus in on CapMail. Uh, CapMail is itself made out of a set of modules. And the modules being written in an object capability language can be structured um, so that different modules are given just the authority they need. But there's still one module that represents the caplet as a whole. You can think of that as the module's main. Um, and all the authorities given to the caplet as a whole are then handed out by the main. The main basically loads top-level modules, wires them together, takes the authorities it's been given, attenuates them, and wires them into the initial state of those modules. So that's, once again, we have a TCB appearing at that level, but then it is able to grant each of those modules in turn least authority. Uh, so for example, the address book needs the contact info, but the address book itself does not need the PGP key ring. So let's focus in on that address book. As a module, uh, all authority given to that module must come in initially through its exports imports. So the exports and imports of the module are the, is the wiring of how the, how the objects in the module initially come to be connected to other things. Um, uh, so we have the further division of authority. So what have we done here with this repeating pattern? Um, uh, by, by hollowing out the attack surface recursively, by doing it at, at every level of composition, um, uh, we're getting a multiplicative benefit. And there is a fractal that I think is a good analogy, the, the Menger sponge, but any fractal where you remove more surface area at every scale, just do it recursively. If at each scale you remove half of the surface, then as you do it recursively, the remaining aggregate surface measuring your aggregate risk is a half times a half times a half approaching zero in the limit.
I'm sorry, the, the yeah. supposition that what? Okay, so when you say opened up an opportunity for threat, there are certainly remaining threats that are not obvious from the diagrams that you're seeing. That's why I emphasize first order. But, but I'm curious when you say opened up effects, that phrase, uh, 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 so open up threats, that phrase indicates that there are threats that weren't there before you did this. No, no I, I used the wrong term. Okay. So that is correct, and it's very important, uh, and uh, one of the and, th and that's why this is a first approximation. Uh, and this first approximation, uh, one way to think about the the main thing that it's not saying in this visualization is this is mostly about sort of initialize and an initial wiring time authority, and it, the graph created by that initial handing out of authority is then dynamically becomes a less sparse graph as Alice passes to Bob a reference to Carol. So that parameter passing is used to set up the initial situation. The initial graph by, by uh, our graph connectivity constraints, only connectivity begets connectivity, means you can reason about the worst case less sparse authority that might result from a given initial graph. Um, uh, but I won't claim that this visualization is doing an adequate job of expressing those dangers. Yeah. This might be related to the question I had. So on, on the vertical axis, is you have the, the principles that have some, some level of authority. I don't quite understand how, it, how you kind of think about, you know, you think about separate, separation of duty where you, know, you need two principles to combine their authority yeah. in order to, to do something, and, and what if they're both colluding to, to, right. to do something? So yeah. So there, is, so there is this whole thing in object capability systems about rights amplification, uh, which I'm ignoring in this talk. Um, I mean, there's, you know, I've, 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 I've been doing this stuff for 30 years, so there's lots and lots of depth that I'm not going to ever fit into a 90-minute talk. Uh, but um, uh, one of the things that's important is often there's, there is a first-order effect that really dominates the overall dynamics so without denying that we need to look at second order effects and third order effects, et cetera, without denying that they're important, in fact, crucial, uh, looking at the first order effects, paying good attention to it, can, get, can still give us a framework within which we can now reason about the second order effects while oriented in the framework. I would, uh, I would say that the security properties that follow from rights amplification uh, are not reflected in anything you're seeing in this talk. Um, uh, and yes, I would say that rights amplification is a second order effect. Um, and uh, I, if I understand correctly, uh, the kinds of separation of duty violations that you're concerned with would correspond to rights amplification. So something else that occurred to me here is that there's no apparent mechanism for revoking permissions because once you pass a reference to somebody, they have that reference in perpetuity and can't ever really be told you can't do that anymore. So, um, so uh, this is where the difference between permission and authority becomes crucial. Um, uh, in 1974, uh, Dave Riddell, um, uh, I think it was his thesis, do you remember? Yeah. Uh, showed a trivial object capability pattern for expressing revocation. Uh, and that is, um, uh, if Alice wants to give, if Alice wants to give Bob revocable access to Carol, or in general, attenuated access to Carol, where revocability is attenuation in time, but for any kind of attenuation, what Alice does is 
she creates a attenuating forwarder, something that acts like Carol but forwards messages to Carol, for which Alice maintains the ability to control the forwarder. So something that simply forwards all messages until Carol, until Alice tells it to stop would be a simple revocation device that is attenuating only in the temporal dimension. Um, and you can have all sorts, and, and part of the, the wonderful logic of object capability patterns is these different ways of attenuating authority. Um, uh, you can have different uh, attenuation patterns which are conceived of separately and then built separately without knowledge of each other and they end up composing very well. So in any case, so speaking of optimistic lies that I'm telling you, um, the, the big one that went by when I showed this uh, slide is that uh, the fractals, as you keep hollowing out, removing, let's say, half the surface at every scale, uh, you approach zero aggregate surface area, which would imply that we have a way to approach zero risk, and we do not. And, it's, and, and we do not for reasons that are, that, that for the reasons you guys have raised, but which are not in my talk, but also for the reasons I'm about to present. But this Menger sponge analogy is so important that that's the basis for our company logo. So in order to see to what degree we got the fractal reduction of area and in what ways we do not, let's quickly go over uh, the same process again, but without zooming. Let's stay at the outer scale. So uh, we first did the area reduction strategy of simple principle of least authority. Uh, and what, that's, what that did is it contracted the uh, each box in the horizontal dimension. Then we did that recursively at every finer scales, uh, and we did that everywhere we can. Um, so that resulted in um, this reduction of density. Um, but notice that there are some boxes on this diagram that are undiminished. And the box that I want to call your attention to are at each level the TCB of that level. Uh, this um, uh, principle of least authority does not reduce the TCB risk. The TCB still has to cover the entire width of the box that it's managing because there still needs to be a mechanism that further subdivides authority among the things within the box. So. If we can't minimize the width of the TCB, what we can do is reduce its height. And we can do that at every level by, by uh, doing the security practices uh, that um, we all know we should be doing, which is minimizing our TCB, making them as small and reviewable as possible, and when we can, to formally verify them. Um, uh, so this goes back to now, I'm sort of going back to the earlier thing where the vertical dimension is now starting to approximate probability or mixing a probability in agents. But the reduction of height, we're trying to minimize the, um, the likelihood that there's a vulnerability by, uh, by um, minimizing and verifying, uh, when possible, our TCBs. Uh, and this notion also helps us direct our effort. The, the level of engineering you need to do on a TCB is very, very expensive. It's much more expensive than normal software engineering. Um, uh, so um, the place where it has most leverage to apply that effort to are the boxes for which we cannot reduce their width. However, there's still some boxes that remain undiminished, and these are the ones within which we're running legacy software. Uh, let's say that we convinced uh, Alan and Doug to run CapDesk, but Barb is still running um, uh, her conventional system and all of her conventional application programs, so her internal attack surface is still complete. Uh, Doug is running CapDesk for most of his stuff, 
but there's a particular program, legacy program that he's running um, that he arranges to run within that, um, uh, manages to, to confine it. So, but, so basically Doug has a, uh, a virtual machine that has all the old stuff, but he gives all of the, the resources that need to be managed by the old stuff to that virtual machine. Um, and then at a yet lower level, you have uh, libraries written in C. And the problem is that we're still sitting on top of a multi-trillion dollar software industry. A, if if um, a security solution says, well, to start out, you have to throw away all your old software and start over from scratch, that's a, a way to achieve security that will never happen. Uh, you have to accommodate legacy, but each legacy box, it can be contained, but by virtue of its legacy, inside the, the, the legacy box, it has whatever leakage of authority it has. There's no, we can't assume any further reduction. What we can do is divide up those legacy boxes into separate boxes. So instead of Doug having uh, one desktop um, uh, running under a virtual machine for all of his legacy programs, he creates a separate virtual machine for each of his legacy programs. And he gives each of those virtual machines just the resources that that program needs to have. Um, and uh, this issue comes up at the operating system level. It comes up with a particular application management system we did at HP called Polaris. Uh, and it comes up even at the level of C libraries that are FFIs for Java if you have the right support for confining C code. Uh, so there's this very wonderful paper on using the Cherry capability hardware uh, to be able to confine uh, FFIs for Java that are written in C so that, the, uh, so that even though they're in the same address space, uh, the integrity of the Java is not threatened. Um, so, um, and once again, Cherry is, is um, within each C compartment, is not preventing it from fouling its own nest, but it's just c creating these separate nests for separate pieces of C to follow. Yeah? Um, I know what you're doing, like for the kernel, that's uh, low, but it, is it like the same um, security to be true? Like you still have some agents in the kernel space that are have to access the resource, right? So having a complete strip of uh, white space is not possible. So the, what I'm showing, what I'm trying to show here is, uh, is not that there is white space, but rather that the height is minimized. Uh, if I was, um, uh, the white space doesn't have any semantic meaning here. What, what, what I uh, should have done if I'd thought about the, the misleadingness of the white space is just contract that row to the height of the, of the red row. Uh, and, and, and notice that I haven't contracted the height to zero, even when you have a verified kernel like SEL4. Uh, the problem with formal verification uh, is that in just the same way we started with the problem that we're not sure what our program means, uh, after formal verification, we're now facing the problem of what does our specification mean. And the specifications for these systems are already more complicated than programs that I can't understand. Um, so we can do a lot to reduce the risk, but we can't eliminate it. So. The thing I want to emphasize is that these different techniques compose together well. And this is why I started off with the, the fractal shape, is that every, a, every technique for reducing um, the aggregate area, if it's orthogonal to the other techniques, they compose together to give you a multiplicative benefit. And um, the uh, systems that I was involved with up until the early 2000s all had this nature and were all engineered to these intuitions. Um, but there's something missing. Historically, all work on software security started with a bad assumption. It started by saying, given uncorrupted hardware, uh, given that the hardware that I you know, walk home from the store with is, d does not already have trapdoors in it. Um, and 
the only reason for that assumption in software security is uh, without the assumption, none of software security does us any good. Um, but the reality is that we don't have uncorruptible hardware. Uh, hardware can be covertly corrupted in many ways, and there are many parties, many other humans outside of my data center that have an interest in corrupting my hardware. Um, yeah. And even if it's not corrupted, the hardware can be buggy. Yes, yes. Um, uh, the hardware can be buggy, and it can be buggy in a way that's exploitable. So, that's, so, it's, it's, so in that sense, the issue isn't malice, it's fallible, where fallible covers both uh, malice and subvertible. Um, so, yes, yes. Uh, it is unlikely that meltdown was on purpose. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm, you know, with doing computer security for a long time, you have to uh, acquire a bit of paranoia. So I, I've got to say, we need to, to entertain the possibility that it wasn't accidental. But on, on, the, on that one specifically, I actually think with very high probability it was accidental. Um, uh, however, uh, one of the things that we know from software companies is that occasionally uh, the government issues a national security letter forcing software companies to corrupt their software in ways that serve uh, the national security apparatus and also uh, force the software company not to reveal that. Given what we know about software companies, to me, it is inconceivable that hardware companies, that Intel has not received a national security letter, um, uh, forcing it to put in uh, trap doors and not talk about it. Uh, but the bizarre thing after I started saying that is I found out about the Intel management engine, which is essentially the corrupted trap door that they're freely admitting to. Um, that enterprise companies. What? Right, so, so this is basically a, um, a, a additional source of massive vulnerability that essentially all work purely in software security historically had failed to address. Today, we're not all using, you know, we're not using time sharing uh, interacting with each other through time sharing a single machine primarily. We're primarily interacting over distributed systems. Uh, and distributed systems introduces another um, fear of corruption, which is, this is what I call the cypherpunk reference assumption. It was sort of the, the, the assumption behind a lot of the cryptography work that the cypherpunks were doing uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, which is over here, Alice and Bob are interacting with each other um, uh, by virtue of Alice's computer interacting with Bob's computer. Alice has physical access to her computer and Bob has physical access to, to his computer. And Alice knows that at least she hasn't corrupted her own hardware, at least she hasn't done it on purpose. Uh, so she has some level of trust in her, in her hardware, uh, but she doesn't trust Bob's hardware and, subject, and symmetrically for Bob, uh, so uh, classically, the way you dealt with mutually suspicious machines is you just uh, put functionality into cryptographic protocols where the cryptographic protocol embodied a logic of interaction such that uh, Alice and Bob can successfully realize the benefits of a cooperative opportunity if they both cooperate, but they're each protected from each other's misbehavior. Well. This notion of a cooperative arrangement where we can have a structured form of interaction we're trying to arrange that if it goes well, we get benefit, but we're protected from each other's misbehavior, going back to human institutions in history, uh, contracts are a rather wonderful notion of how human beings create custom frameworks of interaction that they then bind themselves to uh, in which they, they uh, negotiated them, uh, they negotiated their nature so that the in, their interaction within the contract 
would create benefits of cooperation if things went well, but also protecting them from each other. The problem is that the expressiveness that we want from contracts is well beyond uh, what we can engineer into point-to-point into -point cryptographic protocols. Also, we want contracts that are more than point-to-point -point that involve multiple parties, and doing all of this purely with point-to-point -point cryptographic protocols is not a reasonable form of engineering. So, the um, an historical way to address that is by um, uh, introducing a mutually trusted third party to act as contract host, uh, to to run as um, uh, you know, if, if Alice and Bob find that they can mutually trust Carol to run their contract, then they can turn the contract over to Carol and succeed at cooperating um, uh, through that contract. A great example would be, um, uh, a great analogy is a board manager for a board game. Alice and Bob want to play a game of chess. Alice runs a board manager for chess, ensuring that Alice and Bob can only make legal moves. And now, Bo Alice and Bob can rendezvous at mutually trusted Carol and play a game of chess, knowing that it'll only proceed according to the rules. However, um, uh, in order to do that, in order for that arrangement to be viable, there has to be not just mutual credibility, but mutual expected credibility. It has to be the case that for a set of interacting parties, there's some third party that is mutually credible to all of them. And uh, in order to find that third party, uh, it has to be the case that there are already some third parties which are uh, ones that they mutually expect the others will find um, uh, credible. And for many things that we want to do in the open world across borders with the, our new world of electronic commerce, uh, that's an unreasonable burden. So now I'm going to uh, talk about how I see blockchain, what the fundamental innovation is on blockchain is blockchain is the first mechanism humanity has ever had for building a mutually credible computer. And Ethereum, uh, being a general purpose computer, uh, is, I would say, humanity's first mutually credible general purpose computer. Um, and and the, way, the way it works is that uh, there are these uh, validators in the middle there that are scattered across the globe, scattered across jurisdictions, being run by many different people and many different organizations, uh, running uh, uh, hardware built by different manufacturers, running uh, chips uh, uh, from different fab lines, uh, all of which are, have, have built to the same uh, specification of, a, um, of running an Ethereum virtual machine. So at the level of the replicated computation, they're all producing exactly the same computation. Uh, it should proceed deterministically along, among all well-behaved replicas, replicas in exactly that way. And then the blockchain um, does this massive multi-way cross-checking to ensure that they all agree. And it's by virtue of that diversity of the underlying platforms and then the massive cross-checking of the outcomes of that deterministic uh, replication uh, that We've built something that that's a computer that we can trust to, ex to execute our program according to the semantics of the instruction set that the underlying machine claims to have. The underlying machine, in this case, being the virtual machine in the, thought, in the mutual thought bubble of all the validating machines. And now, uh, Alice and Bob um, uh, can take a look, can, can regard that virtual machine produced by the blockchain as a whole as a trusted enough third party. Once again, there's some red in there because we never reduce our risk to zero, but it can be credible enough that for a wide range of contracts with real value at stake, um, uh, that will often be good. And with regard to this mutual expectation of mutual credibility, the global nature of blockchains like Ethereum uh, give us 
global mutually expected credibility gives us a coordination rendezvous point without having to engage in complex worldwide negotiation about who we mutually trust. We can just rendezvous at these points. And that means that we can uh, use these as platforms to build smart contracts that coordinate co in a trustworthy manner cooperation among many, many different parties without having to pre-negotiate what the contract test is. Yeah. So, I, so I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked that because I was not planning to touch upon that in this talk, but it is a very important topic. So uh, there's a general category of what we call hybrid contracts, uh, and then there's a particular case of hybrid contract called a split contract uh, that I'll explain as the answer to that question. Um, the uh, contracts have many, many terms in them which are fundamentally not automatable. When a contract says something like uh, good faith or best efforts, uh, all of these terms are, are evoking judgments that are necessarily human judgments about other humans. So a hybrid contract is, is in general one that has two components and they're both negotiated together. There is the program code uh, that, is to, that is the automated portion of the contract and then there's um, a prose text written in a natural language that is for the purpose of, um, of being interpreted by humans uh, when the contract is under dispute in order to resolve the dispute. Um, uh, and um, actually, so I won't go further into that. Yeah, but but it's in, the, in the context of automatable contracts. Right. So it is, very, it is very important. It's been, it's been largely neglected. Uh, uh, Ian, I've been talking about uh, split contracts for a long time. Ian Grigg has been talking about Ricardian contracts for a long time. Both of those are forms of hybrid contracts. Uh, and these are very, very important. One of the things that economists in theorizing about what is going on in contracts um, uh, uh, talk about open contracts, contracts that are, that are purposely open-ended to deal with the uncertainty about what things even mean in the future world that we're now trying to describe the rights and obligations of in the present world. Um, and th that kind of open-endedness can only be captured today in prose for humans to interpret. In order to ever get to a world in which much of the contract terms that we're interested in might be executable by software, we have to go through a world in which we know how to automate a little bit and we still need to resort to prose text for a lot. But the prose text does not have to be a legal contract interpreted by a legal jurisdiction. Uh, it, it can be um, uh, just a judgment by a set of auditors that were pre-agreed upon when the original contract was, was set in motion. Yeah. Yep, uh, and the, uh, this problem that under our current architecture, whenever we link in a library, we just give it all of the authority of the program we linked it into, is insanity. Uh, but it, it is uh, what is practiced pervasively, what, I'm, uh, in, what myself and others at Agoric, as well as collaborators uh, at several other companies, uh, Salesforce, um, uh, people on the Node security team, are doing a safe module system for JavaScript based on SES, which is our object capability subset of JavaScript. And at this point, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, yes? When you do a blockchain, aren't you introducing more chances to leak data? Ah, I am so glad you said that. That is a perfect segue for the very next set of slides. So blockchain is no kind of ultimate answer to a credible computer. 
uh, there's a trade-off space. And one way, one first approximation, um, uh, you know, a, a first order consideration of the trade-off space um, uh, is to think about different systems that require k out of n agreement. Um, a blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum or Zcash uh, uh, use Nakamoto consensus, which just requires a simple majority. Um, uh, classic Byzantine fault tolerance requires two thirds. Um, uh, you know, obviously there's a meaningful thing on, at unanimity. And very importantly, at the lower left corner, there's a solo machine, which is just the one out of one agreement. It's just a program running on a single machine. And all of these points have different attributes with regard to a set of trade-offs. But before I show the, the, um, what the trade-off space looks like, just another, another note of caution, not to scale. Uh, don't take the, the, the specific uh, shades of color that I've used or the specific placement of different systems on the slide too seriously. It's meant to be suggestive as, of a way to think about the trade-offs. So the main thing that, uh, that massive multi-way replication gives us is integrity, is the, the idea that the underlying machine actually proceeds according to the semantics of its instruction set, that our programs uh, execute according to what the program says. Doesn't mean they're correct. The program might still be buggy, but the underlying machine is correct. Um, so uh, as we go, as n becomes larger, our integrity goes up uh, quite extremely. On the lower left is the way we do almost all of our computation today, which is on solo machines uh, that are, should not be considered uh, credible. And especially your solo machine is not something I should regard as credible. Confidentiality, the issue you're raising, goes as almost the inverse of integrity, um, except that the, you fall off the cliff very quickly. Uh, as soon as you have significant replication, where what is being replicated uh, is visible to all the validators, uh, then you basically have no confidentiality. And we see this in Ethereum, uh, which is all computation is completely transparent. Um, and this also, Ethereum is a very nice demonstration of a principle, which is integrity should never depend on confidentiality. Ethereum is great for integrity. It has no confidentiality. Everything that happens on Ethereum is completely transparent forever, um, uh, but the, um, the other agents interacting with Ethereum are interacting from solo machines off to the side that have the cryptographic secrets that in turn interact with Ethereum. Uh, I also want to call um, attention here in general, there's another caution on this trade-off space, is the trade-off space um, is mostly just showing uh, what follows from the different choices of K and N, but those are not the only knobs at our disposal. Uh, Zcash, um, uh, while achieving the integrity that comes from being a Bitcoin-like blockchain, uh, also achieves an astonishing amount of uh, confidentiality by virtue of zero-knowledge proofs. All the validators are blindly validating uh, that um, the uh, Zcash computation is proceeding correctly without being able to see it. Um, but doing that for general purpose computation uh, is uh, still not practical. Uh, it will probably be a while before it's practical. But even with Zcash, it requires some, some trust that the setup. Uh, yes, uh, Starks is getting beyond that. Um, uh, but if you read about, I mean, so once again, going to the, you never reduce risk to zero. The Zcash ritual, as they call it, uh, is such a massive multi-way mutual assurance such that if one of the participants in the ritual was good, even if all of the other ones were in a mutual conspiracy to corrupt it, one genuinely good one would be adequate to initialize Zcash to a secure state. Um, uh, so to me, I find it surprising that people were so uncomfortable with that level of assurance to the point where they needed to invent Starks. But Starks is the new zero knowledge proof technology that does not have that requirement for initial trust. So um, with availability, um, the blockchains by virtue of their um, uh, pervasive replication are reachable from anywhere. Uh, many machines will stay up no matter what. 
Um, uh, I mean, not any one machine will stay up no matter what, but many of the machines of the system as a whole will be up at any one moment. Uh, so those systems are highly available. A uh, solo machine can just crash. Um, and as we approach unanimity in terms of our K out of N agreement rule, uh, now we can become unavailable because of holdouts. And then uh, speed, um, uh, solo machines just shine on speed over anyth anything else. Um, uh, as soon as you get even a little bit of distribution, um, uh, you, you suddenly fall off a, cl a cliff on performance. So solo machines will continue to be important. So what I'm trying to emphasize with this trade-off space is lots of different points in this trade-off space will continue to exist because people will have many different trade-offs with regard to where they want to be on this trade-off space. So there's no one point which is the ultimate solution. Um, uh, so we need systems that can coexist across this range of, vi of viable points on the trade-off space. So now, finally, I'm going to talk about uh, what Agoric is doing. So uh, what we're doing uh, is using now the um, highlighted um, elements on the right. Uh, CES is secure ECMAScript. Uh, it's an object capability subset of JavaScript um, uh, that was enabled by um, uh, uh, enabling mechanisms I originally got into uh, ECMAScript 5. Uh, and have uh, since, uh, I've been on the ECMAScript committee since about 2007. Uh, and now we're collaborating with a bunch, a bunch of other parties, the ones that I mentioned before, to also bring more of these uh, security mechanisms directly into the JavaScript standard so that they can be supported more directly. But right now, JavaScript is already the case. Uh, we can run SES securely on, the, on something that conforms to the existing JavaScript standard. Uh, uh, Dr. Sess is a uh, distributed, resilient, secure ECMAScript uh, where, there is, um, where the ECMAScript computation is made persistent uh, and distributed via the new CAPTP protocol, the Capability Transfer Protocol. And the Agoric blockchain is, in, is the, the first blockchain we're building. We're building it as a Cosmos zone. So Cosmos is one, is one of the new um, uh, blockchain startups. Um, and they're building a very, very interesting system to um, uh, help people create new blockchains that have some custom logic that are able to participate in an ecosystem of their other blockchains as well as other things. So they have very similar goals that we do with regard to the interoperation. So over here we have the range, uh, so each individual square over here is a physical machine, but each tower over here is what we regard as a machine, um, uh, which is made out of agreement among the physical machines in the tower. On top of that, uh, we place the level of abstraction we call the VAT level, where, you, where each VAT is a uh, event loop, is a container holding an event loop, uh, that, um, uh, as you may be familiar with from JavaScript, uh, processes one event at a time to completion before it accepts the next event. Uh, and these VATs communicate with each other uh, so that the object layer that we build on top of the VAT layer, every object is in some VAT. So the VATs are a disjoint partitioning of the object graph. Objects within the same VAT can invoke each other directly, as you would expect in a normal object language. But objects can also send asynchronous messages to objects and other VATs. And cryptographically, um, uh, down through these layers, uh, we ensure that the distributed communication obeys the same capability safety rules as the local uh, implementations, modulo this distinction between un unforgeability and unguessability. And then finally, um, uh, we build on all of that our um, uh, co smart contract framework, our, uh, our abstractions for, electronic, for transferable electronic rights, transferable and tradable electronic rights, 
our, um, uh, our uh, components and framework uh, for, sm for composing smart contracts to build smart contracts, understandably out of contract building blocks. Uh, and at this layer, the composability of object capability abstractions uh, was extremely supportive of us creating a system of interacting contracts where the contracts themselves could be composed in a rich manner and, with a, with, and do so in a largely understandable manner. And um, uh, in order to build each level out of the layer below, uh, you re-engineer um, uh, various protocols. So that, that DP turns out to be very much aligned with the IBC, inter-blockchain protocol, uh, from Cosmos. So uh, Agoric and Cosmos are collaborating on reconciling the differences between IBC and VATDP. Not only are they very much attacking essentially the same problem, they actually arrived at very similar solutions. Uh, on top of that, we have our capability trans transport protocol, um, uh, which is very much like what we had uh, between, on between only single machines in the old pre-blockchain days, but now lifted to run on top of chains and other agreement mechanisms as well. And then ERTP is the electronic rights transfer protocol. So what's going on here is that uh, in order, we always could have built smart contracts without the blockchain, but the contracts need to run somewhere and contracts are sort of the hot spot where you need mutual credibility. The hardware level at the, at, the low, at, at, at the low level of abstraction, providing us underlying platforms that were mutually credible, allowed us at the high level of abstraction to create patterns that were only meaningful when you had such mutual credibility. So, um, so now we finally addressed the hardware problem, reducing <laughs> the, um, uh, the, the height of that box uh, as well. Uh, um, but uh, it's important to remember that blockchains by themselves are not a panacea. This is often missed by people in the blockchain space, uh, which is a blockchain now gives us the equivalent of reliable hardware, hardware that we can uh, treat, that, that we can uh, treat as trustworthy. Back in the history of computer security bef before blockchain, all of software security was making the assumption that they had that hardware anyway, even though they didn't. Um, so now that we've given them what they've already assumed, everything that they then built on that assumption is now relevant. So just saying blockchain without, on top of it, building the kind of software security architecture uh, that the history of software security has taught us are good architectures, um, won't solve the problem. You have to take it up through all the levels of abstraction in order to really reduce the risk to the point that we can lift the trade-off curve uh, and uh, enable a more cooperative world. institutions that are incentivized in certain ways, drafted and blah, 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 blah. Um, I, can, can, I guess, can I get your thoughts on the, on the differences between those two solutions with reference to the costs of them? Okay. So for this to be a positive contribution is if it grows within the current system of human institutions and the current non-blockchain-based uh, uh, institutional lessons about how to arrange for human cooperation, uh, and it needs to emerge not as a, se as a separate world isolated from that, but as a world that's continuous with it. So 
Another very important kind of hybrid contract is the contract in which the prose actually is a legal contract. That, that some of the arrangements that are very interesting are where you have an automated contract that is built for automated uh, execution coupled with what is sometimes a separate legal contract which, where, the, where the two are composed together where they can solve a problem by having one foot in the legal system and one foot in cyberspace that you can't solve well just in one system by itself. Um, so altogether, I think that the, um, uh, the adoption problem that the blockchain world has been having uh, is largely, largely due to following an ideology of we need a pure separated world rather than um, even if we have sort of a pure, uncorrupted technology at one extreme of what we're building, we need the entire continuum of compromise between that and the real world to hook it up in a rich way to the real world of human institutions and real world of commerce. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So I wonder, I mean, since you mainly focused on integrity, uh, yes. in your talks, I wonder, like maybe in the philosophical space, what to what degree do you do you think that uh, you know, the problem of confidentiality uh, hinders cooperation? I mean, I think that there's some level of, of you know. There are trust issues around confidentiality as well, and like expectations of, of confidentiality, and, and how how do you think that you can foster more cooperation when you need you know, that, that kind of uh, high assurance of confidentiality? So, first of all, I want to say I agree with everything you just said. Um, uh, uh, most of my work uh, is targeted at integrity. Uh, object capability languages in particular have, on, have very clearly only made strong claims about integrity. Uh, they're not making strong claims either about confidentiality or availability. Uh, one of the nice things about formal reasoning uh, is that you can soundly reason about integrity in a modular manner. Uh, you cannot soundly reason about confidentiality in a modular manner because so many of the confidentiality leaks are cross-abstraction level. Um, so a lot of um, uh, like information flow confidentiality work uh, starts off by saying, let's assume away covert channels. Well, I mean, okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's assume away the hard problem, uh, and now let's solve the easy problem. And, you know, like, like with you know, software security as a whole and insecure hardware, maybe if we solve the easy problem, we can come back to the hard problem later and find that we can do something that makes the solution to the easy problem relevant. Um, but right now, uh, covert channels and side channels are, are a huge deal. Um, there are some special cases that we can solve very well on confidentiality. Um, uh, and uh, we have a challenge page up on the web uh, that shows the use of SES Secure ECMAScript to address one of those special cases for, co for confidentiality for side channels, um, which is uh, a lot of our, our libraries, a lot of our library code, not so much our applications as a whole, but many of our libraries are libraries that do a transformational job of you know, parsers and, and, and generators and, and you know, pattern recognizers and just a tremendous amount of our software are, is one that doesn't need to cause any effects on the outside world. It takes data as input, computes a result, and then emits the result and it's over. Um, it's a, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, there's many software that doesn't fit that characterization, but there's many that do. Such software does not need to be given the ability to measure duration. It can still signal on covert and side channels to other software that can measure duration. So it can still emit on side channels, but it cannot perceive side channels. Uh, and in our challenge page, we have a hugely egregious side channel that even being able to estimate milliseconds is enough to easily read the data on the side channel. Uh, and then we challenge anybody to write software uh, within, within the SES sandbox, where everything's in one address space. So it's, you know, all the meltdown inspector assumptions are violated. Everything's in one address space. 
Um, um, uh, but the, the, the um, challenge code that you run is run without any ability to measure duration. Uh, we actually did have some responsible disclosures of some bugs people found against that, which were very interesting. Uh, but those were bugs in our framework, not bugs in the concept. We fixed those. Uh, so that's, that's an important special case. Uh, there's a recent paper by the SEL4 guys uh, that, um, I, that I, I frankly haven't read. And despite that, I will recommend without qualification, read everything the SEL4 guys write. Um, uh, but it's one on what they call time protection, where they create um, uh, basically separate worlds that, 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 that under some reasonable assumptions have no side channels or covert channels between them. And they do it not by sharing a single SEL4 kernel among them, but basically by using SEL4 as a virtual machine monitor to create multiple uh, SEL4 inst instantiation. So each subsystem is run on full SEL4, and it's only those large grain things that can, that can leak to each other. Uh, finally, I want to talk, call attention to the two parts of green over here. Um, a lot of computation is run on small machines or, in, or and in small scale replicated forms within a single organization, within a single household. Um, not so much the quarters, but the single machines. Um, and if they were running appropriately secure software, the fact that they're running within the physical box of a house gives you a somewhat defensible initial boundary for side channels, uh, given that you take all the software measures around that that people almost never get. Um, uh, and then, uh, having talked that much about confidentiality, uh, just mention Zcash again and then skip the bill. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll admit that I've always been kind of mildly. Horrified. I'm sorry, can you speak oh, up? Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that I've always been kind of horrified by Ethereum and smart contracts. Because, like, oh no, what if we're living in a world where there's some, you know, you're living in a I'm sorry, I, I, your, your voice volume dropped again. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, I'll admit that I've always kind of been a little bit horrified by the concept of smart contracts in Ethereum, because then you have Ethereum advocates who are like, oh, you'll be living in your apartment, and you know, your apartment police will be controlled by a smart contract, and then what if there's a bug in your apartment, and you get, you know... So that's... That, but, um, yeah, but, but I'm sure that could be worked out. Um, your uh, object's capability model is pretty interesting. Um, I, I'll admit that I'd sort of thought that that was kind of a bug in the, the design of Java because it doesn't really give you access control over over like fields. If, if you you know if you, have an, if you have a reference to an object, you can access anything in the object, and that's like a big so, bag so for us. But it is a pretty good I'm sorry, security. Since it's a long question, yeah, I'm going to interrupt you with answers to the parts of the question. Um, uh, with regard to the what you call the access control, the way you deal with that in an object capability system uh, is. Uh, is what I mentioned that Dave Riddell did with the, with the attenuating folder, is um, uh, you don't give out, the, the object itself represents um, a permanent irrevocable permission to provoke the entirety of the behavior that you can provoke through the object's API. <coughs> if you want to give out something less than that, you don't try to build some access control mechanism into the object itself. Rather, you create other objects in front of that object where the other objects can impose some attenuation on the messages that they forward through. Forward through only a subset or transform the messages in some way. A great example that shows how important this notion of attenuation is, is an MMU is essentially presenting as virtual memory a very important attenuation of physical memory. It's a remapping attenuation. And that also comes up a lot where you're not just allowing a subset of accesses through, you're doing it by remapping namespaces. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I do agree with that. I, I just thought it was interesting because I hadn't thought about it in that context. It does make sense from a security perspective. You can give access, but once you give access, you can't provoke it. Basically. Yeah. So uh, uh, did I, uh, is there a thrust of the question that I missed having answered a sub-question? Uh, not. I, 
I think in, in this specific context, um, I was sort of complaining about the access of, of uh, you can't, never mind, it's, it's not that important. You've mentioned virtual machines a number of times. Mm -hmm. Virtual machines is an area that I work in a lot. Um, but you haven't mentioned Linux containers at all. Mm -hmm. Care a comment on Linux containers as opposed to virtual machines? Uh, so, so the problem <coughs> with Linux containers is what it gives me is a system with the semantics of Linux which is already hopelessly insecure. What, it, what a virtual machine gives me is a semantics of a, a modern instruction set, which if it's a principled modern instruction set with good system user mode distinctions and appropriate uh, mapping of the MMU, whether purely virtual or para paravirtual, um, uh, those are underlying primitives that are extremely good for building secure operating systems. So you can um, you know, I assume, I don't actually have, don't know this for sure, but I assume you can run SEL4 under a virtual machine that fully emulates the hardware that SEL4 is assuming. Uh, but, you, but you can't run SEL4 on top of a Linux container. So by building a Linux container, you're starting off in a situation which you're already lost, and now you're building a situation which you virtually lost. Yeah? So, so I take it you're not a huge fan of SEL4? <laughs> Let me caution everybody that SE Linux describes what it's doing using the term capabilities. Uh, they are not capabilities, they do not even resemble capabilities. They are about as far from capabilities as a concept as you can get. Um, uh, uh, and uh, yes, beyond that I'm not a fan of SE Linux. If you want to start with Unix and build something that has some good security properties, I am a fan of Capsicum. Uh, Capsicum is a modified FreeBSD kernel. There's a project to port those modifications into the Linux kernel. Uh, and it has a capability mode uh, that uh, is based on the realization that Unix domain sockets, the file descriptors for Unix domain sockets, essentially already obey capability modes. Uh, so a program can throw itself into capability mode, in which case it's running in a, in a, essentially with everything that's not capability-like turned off, and then with a set of services as, as capability-based alternatives to the things that were turned off, where the alternatives present the service in a capability-oriented manner. Um, and uh, once again, um, uh, any security prescription that says, throw away your multi-trillion dollar legacy and start over from scratch is just a prescription that's not going to happen. So, so things like Capsicum as other way stations are extremely important. So I, I'm just, I know you know this, but I'm just going to make an announcement for the people that don't know this. Um, uh, mock, the mock microkernels was mentioned in this talk. I don't know if you realize that the mock microkernel is in every Mac OS, every iPhone, and every iPad that's ever been shipped. It was at least in the last 10 years. So that, that capability expectation is built in there right now, today. You're carrying it around. Yeah, but the, uh, unfortunately, the capability, <coughs> the underlying capability nature of mock is, is nowhere uh, exposed or made use of. So it's it's kind of, it's got, they paid all the costs to have a capability system underneath and are achieving none of the benefit. I'm Absolutely. sorry, not none of the benefit. Uh, no, you're right the first time. They're achieving none of the benefit. Well, um, okay, there's there's another case where they achieve some of the benefit, uh, and it's also as surprisingly pervasive. Uh, every Qualcomm chip uh, that's the main processor chip of a cell phone, cell, your, all your cell phones are built with a, um, essentially with two CPUs. Uh, one running your, your, you know, your mobile operating system and one actually doing the phone, so the, 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 the phone software itself. Um, Qualcomm is one of the more popular chips. Every Qualcomm chip runs the L4 operating system. L4 is the ancestor of SEL4. 
Um, uh, it is not a capability system, but it's capability influence. SEL4 is a genuine capability system and is a formally verified uh, high performance microkernel. Um, so one can imagine a future in which our Qualcomm chips uh, are upgraded to run SEL4, uh, in which case our uh, the cell phone chips that we can't run software on would be a tremendously better uh, system to run software on than the mobile OS is we're currently using. Any other questions? Okay, great. Let's thank the speaker again.